you never know how good you're going to be. But what you want to do is give yourself the chance to be the best you can be. That's nice between uh, Youngs and Farrell. And here is Mike Brown. And Mike Brown! Showing the strength. What a start from England. Eddie Jones, really looking forward to this conversation because rugby fans know you as the head coach of the England rugby team, but we don't really necessarily know about Eddie Jones, the man. So we'll start off with, with your childhood. What were you like as a kid? Reasonably studious. Pretty quiet. Uh, you know, I was half Japanese, half Australian, so I was small. And the way to make it in, a, in schools in Australia is to be good at sport. So I was desperate to be good at at rugby, desperate to be good at cricket. I, I wanted to play cricket for Australia, that was my dream. Your parents obviously a huge influence in yourself and the way you are. How did they uh, guide you into rugby as such? Or did they, or did rugby just find you? Uh, well, my mother's Japanese and she didn't want me playing sport. You know, everyone in Australia starts playing the game at five and I wasn't allowed to start until I was 10. Right. But then, you know, I got a little bit good at it and then she was more supportive. But they were, they were great parents because they supported, but they weren't pushy. What did your mum want you to do then if she didn't want you to play rugby? Uh, anything but. Really? <laughs> did you enjoy the physicality of rugby? I loved the, that rugby was such a tactical game. You know, so as you know, with rugby, you can win it any number of ways, but you've always got to be physical, you've always got to be tough, and you've always got to be committed to a team but then there are different ways of winning it, and uh, that's what probably attracted me the most. And what, what were you like as uh, a young man playing rugby? Very dedicated, very committed, you know. I used to go for a run every morning at six o'clock. We had a Dalmatian dog and I'd run three miles every morning, then I'd go down the park and throw a practice line out throwing. Yeah, you know, so, and then I'd finish work or whatever, school, and then I'd go back and I'd do weights by myself. And I knew I had to get bigger and stronger, and the only way I was going to do that was do it by myself. What kind of player were you? Were you a leader in the locker room? Were you the quiet assassin? Were you the one who was uh, always going forward with the team, driving them on? What kind of player were you? Good team man. Yeah. Um, always worked hard for the team. We've had word from a guy that played against you. He said you were quite ferocious. Yeah, well, yeah, again, you had to find a way to be competitive. So if you're 80k hooker, you've got to have something going for you because you haven't got size, you haven't got speed, you haven't got strength. So, you know, I, I made my mark as being a good team player and then being able to maybe get in the heads of the opposition a little bit. And you had a brief uh, period at Leicester. One of the best experiences I had. And I think that probably led me to coach. This opportunity came to play for six months at Leicester. So playing this game, Anyway, the ball got kicked out, and as I said, you know, I always wanted to try to do something a little bit different. I grabbed the ball and threw a quick line out. Then I felt this hand on the back of my shoulder, and it was a tight head prop, and he said, son, we don't do that around here, this is Leicester. <laughs> and but that was the strength of, you know, it really got me to understand how important it is for teams to have an identity, mm -hmm. because immediately you play for Leicester, no one needed to speak about the culture. That was how it operated. You know, you fit in, you fit in, you do your job, and then you're part of the team. And it was a great experience I had, I loved it. What drove you to coaching then? You, you said that when you were at Leicester, it was that environment that you thought, you know what, I'm, I fancy a little bit of coaching. Well, it actually happened a bit earlier than that. I was the Randwick first team hooker, and I was the starting New South Wales hooker. I went back to the second team, and I remember the coach saying to me one day, he said, you talk a lot, so you might as well coach the team as well. So I actually ended up coaching the second team for a season, and we won the comp. So I thought oh, I might have a go at this. What made Eddie Jones the coach that he is? There was a Prime Minister called Paul Keating in Australia. And I remember one of the things I read about him, he said, whenever you're starting out a career, go and find the people who are about to retire, because they'll tell you everything because they they've got nothing to hide, you know, they want to share it. So I've, I've gone out of my way now consistently to find coaches that have been in the game a long time towards the end of their career and, and just basically pick their brains. I'm getting to the stage now where people are coming to me. And, and, <laughs> but that's, that's what, and the other thing I think I've always done is I've always shared my information. I've never hidden it, which m makes you more urgent to find new ways of doing things. Mm. 
Who's had the biggest impact on you so far? Uh, well, when I was coaching in Japan, probably the coach who had the biggest influence was Pep. Right. So he was at Bayern Munich because they played, you know, they played that Barcelona, that what they called tic tac, yeah, you know, where the ball's moving. With Japan, with like our biggest player was about this big, so we had to find a way to beat bigger teams, and it was only through moving the ball quickly. And so I went and spent an hour and a half. He he stayed until I think it was about seven o'clock at night. Stayed in his office, had a full day. Gave me an hour and a half, two hours at the end of the day to talk about his approach to that. And it was a really insightful discussion we had and really helped me coach Japan. You know, since I've been in England, I've been lucky enough to meet guys like Arsene Wenger, Alex Ferguson, Roy Hodgson, Gareth Southgate. And again, from each of those, you pick up just little bits. That's gone loose and it's picked up by Farrell and Mays pairing after it. He's never scored a try in the Six Nations. He'll never have a better chance. Do you wear blinkers when you're prepping a team? As in, do you have tunnel vision or do you keep your eye on the opposition and what they're doing? Again, probably about an 80 20 rule. 80% uh, on us, 20% on the opposition. And again, when I was younger, probably look too much at the opposition because there's only so much you can do in a certain period of time. So, yeah, we only have the team for five days before the first test against South Africa. You're looking at the players you've got, so they're your players. Yeah. Then you work out, I've got an idea how I want to play, that's the idea of how I want to play. Then you work out, how can I make these players at their best playing this sort of game? And you might end up with this. That's the game you end up with. Right. Because very rarely you can have the perfect game. England rugby is generally quite conservative. You know, it's, it's about set piece, it's about defence. And we haven't tried to change that, but we know to win the World Cup, we've got to add a little bit. Yeah. And we're in the process of adding that little bit at the moment, which is not always easy. Do you have any hobbies now that you had as a, a young man back in the day? Well, I used to be a keen golfer and I wasn't much good. So it was quite a stressful <laughs> hobby. So I've, got, I've, I've been that. Have, have you ever been on the little nine uh, hole course at Penny Hill Park? No, that surprises me. No, <laughs> not at all. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of making a comeback later, golf. Right, so, so you had golf. Any, anything else? Uh, well, I love cricket. You know, I love sport, watching sport. Now we've got a little dog. What kind of dog have you got? Uh, a little papillon, yeah. Oh. Uh, do you and your wife go walking your dog? Ah, uh, yeah, 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 but she doesn't need much exercise. Like she does one lap of the office and she's tired. <laughs> <laughs> who, who cooks in your house? Uh, my wife, yeah. And w what's your favourite dish that your wife cooks? Uh, just simple food, grilled fish, rice and some vegetables. Are you conscious of what you eat, Eddie? Ah, uh, very much so now, really? yeah. As you get older, you have to be, mate. It's yeah. funny, you know, when you're a rugby player, I was a little guy. You spend your whole life trying to get as big as you can, then you spend the rest of your life trying to stay as small as you can. <laughs> so, Eddie, let, let's briefly talk about your time as, as England coach. Two and a half years in, how do you think it's gone? I've always seen it as a four-year project. Um, first year was about establishing a foundation, which I think we did reasonably well, and we probably had more success than we were entitled to have. <laughs> Second year is about making sure you got the foundation right, and again, we did quite well there. Third year is always the most difficult year because you've got to make change. Mm. Because a lot of the team that you've had for the first two years, maybe some of those players are at the end of their career um, and you've got to regenerate the team. And as we've found out, that can be, there's some pain involved in that, but winning is not a straight line. So I think we're in a great position. When you watched England from the outside prior to being our head coach, what one thing did you think you would want to change if you were coach of, of England? And have you changed that? Uh, yeah, about clarity about how they play and about being English, yeah. not being a copy of other teams. Because I think, yeah, you know, you've got New Zealand there, which is a benchmark of international rugby. Of any team, really, isn't it? And, and what everyone tries to do is to copy that. You can't copy something. Yeah, you've got to come up with your own way of doing it. And, and particularly, I think, for, for the English team, it's important we, we keep being an English team. And that's not to say we don't need to keep evolving. Well, one thing we do have, and from my experience of meeting the guys, is we have a great cast of characters. There's players that just bounce and spark off other players. And that, I think, is a compliment to 
you being able to bring that out? Yeah, well, I think it's more a compliment to the senior players that they right. create a good environment, you know, because at the end of the day, as a coach, we only really have them from nine to five, mm. you know, because we can't go in their rooms at night. Yeah. So what they do between five in the afternoon and nine the next day is generally the responsibility of the senior players. It, it seems to be coffee club, Eddie, yeah. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> And they do, they have fun. Yeah. You know, we, uh, I always remember, like, it was a tough tour this afternoon. We, we lost the first two tests. Wednesday we had a day off. The guys went over to a park across from the hotel and played cricket. They had a great time. Now, I haven't seen that for a long time for a professional team. Just guys enjoying each other's company. And it's a real credit to the senior players. Let's talk about our journey towards uh, the World Cup. It's going to be in Japan. With Japanese culture, it's going to be a completely different tournament, isn't it? You know, obviously a time difference as well from the UK and you've got to prep them. Um, are the guys excited? Are, are they thinking that far ahead? Because I know you're a day-to-day -day guy, right? Yeah, they won't start thinking about that until after Six Nations. Right. That's traditionally, you know, because they know to get to the World Cup, they've got to, there's certain things they've got to do and, and to get to the World they've Cup. They've got to get in the squad they've first, got to get in the squad. So they won't be thinking about that until post Six Nations and then, you start focusing more on the World Cup then. That's the 2nd of November, so that's the peak. Right. We're here now. Now, we don't need the peak now. We don't need the peak there. We don't need the peak there. We need the peak there. So everything's about peaking. Right. Yeah, and that's the secret of a World Cup campaign. Be right when you need to be right. It's no use being a front runner now. Uh, Eddie, thank you very much for chatting to us. It's been an absolute joy and a real insight into Eddie Jones' demand. Thank you. Absolutely pleasure. Cheers. Thank you.